Hare Krishna. So today morning, I am discussing from the Srimad Bhagavatam, and this is a very catastrophic event that is happening where insults lead to injury and that leads to violence. Now, uh, in this particular section, after the whole pandemonium has happened, Lord Shiva's messengers have come and break Dakshad assembly. Now, after the event, the devtas are rushing for help to Brahmaji. Vishnu is not so easily accessible, so they are going to Brahma for help. And in the purport, Prabhupada, uh, in the verse, it is said that Brahmaji, knowing what would happen, Brahma and Shiva, they did not come there. They would not come there. So I'll speak today on the topic of how a part of a part of taking responsibility is knowing when to not take responsibility. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Integral to taking responsibility is knowing when to not take responsibility. And within that, I'll take three points that. Everyone has free will and even God can't control that entirely. Second is we all have finite capacities. And third is we need to do what it takes to nourish ourselves so that we can use our free will properly. So take each of these points and we will have some questions in between also after each point if you have questions. So now. <clears throat> human life is as we say meant for being responsible responsible as the word if we split it in a different sense responsible that we should be able to take choose the right response and that means as situations emerge we need to think about the situation and then think what is the best course of action that I can do in this situation so while we take responsibility for, our, uh, for ourselves and if we take any position of leadership, we take responsibility for others also. At that time, and we are all in some way taking responsibility for others. That means even if we are in any relation, any kind of relationship with anyone, we are a friend of someone, we are the parent of someone, even if we are the child of someone, you know, the actions of those whom we are connected with affect us. So, uh, now if we want to take, resp- a, a, if we want to take responsibility, now what can we take responsibility for? We cannot take responsibility for others actions directly, in the sense that others have free will. And in this particular situation, when it is said that Brahma and Vishnu did not come to the assembly knowing that a disaster was going to happen over there. Now we may say if a disaster is going to happen, they should come beforehand and try to avoid the disaster, isn't it? Normally, it is said that uh, a principle in firefighting is fight the fire before it starts, not after it has started or not after it has burned things down. So, with respect to fire, it is obviously true because fire is insentient, fire does not have free will or consciousness. So, if we can extinguish the fire before it starts off or just when it's starting off, it will go off. But with respect to people, they have free will. And when they have free will, sometimes people have to learn the lessons through experience, not through intelligence. Although we say that it is best to learn through intelligence. But sometimes we all have to go through certain experiences, we have to experience the consequences of our actions and only then we will learn. So, if we do not acknowledge that others have free will. If we overestimate our capacity to control others, then we simply get ourselves into trouble. Because, say with respect to a fire, we just go there and extinguish it. But sometimes when somebody is about to do something wrong, and at that time, we forcibly stop them from doing something wrong. Now you think, I am, I am protecting you. And it is true at one level. We are trying to protect them, but it may backfire and they may start resenting us and they may start uh, going against us. Say if there's a, there's a standard example for intersectionary 
act action is that if somebody is walking off a cliff or walking off a terrace and we see them walking off the terrace we should rush there and warn them that don't walk off you'll fall down now in that case the danger is very simple and very very clear it's just that they are not noticing it we tell them you'll fall off from here and they will notice it but with respect to normal day to day conduct it is not so easy to recognize the danger if somebody wants to choose a particular course of action and then they uh, this this is what i want to do and if others tell them don't do this and quite often what happens is people start thinking that see, there's authority under the subordinate and the subordinate is doing something wrong now the authority may be well intentioned thing don't do this but if the subordinate is convinced that this is what i want to do and then what may happen is the subordinate instead of feeling grateful that the authority has protected me the subordinate may start thinking that actually the th the authority is not my well wisher the authority is my illusion and therefore authority is trying to repress me because the authority doesn't want me to succeed or authority is envious of me or whatever the mind can work in many different ways so now if we consider in the devotional circles there are two dangers one is sin and another is offense there is pap and there is aparad so the person is going on the wrong track they will commit sin but if we try to forcibly stop them they will commit offense and from the spiritual perspective sin is not as damaging as offense so if somebody commits sin and then they do something wrong and they bear they get the consequences for that they will come to their senses oh i did something wrong but if they commit an offense they think you know oh devotees are my ill wishers then they go away from devotees so even if somebody does something wrong even if somebody sins then still the path to krishna is there for them because still they have some relationship with devotees maybe at that time they will realize oh what you told me was right but if they start developing hostility towards devotees then they will never come back so what is important is that the relationship not be damaged entirely now of course for some people in some situations you tell them don't do this and they will listen but we can also sense the pulse of people about how determined they are to do something and if somebody is completely convinced about doing something then they may they may find that uh, they, they just if we tell them don't do it then they will end up uh, becoming alienated from us and they may blame us so sometimes we just have to acknowledge that people have their free will and we can't do anything about it so this especially is true in parenting or counseling as a uh, as children go up and become um, come to teenage and they want to assert their independence and sometimes children may want to especially somebody is born in a devotional culture for most of us the philosophy came before the practices we understood the philosophy this made sense and then he started adopting some practices for those who are born in devotional families the practices come before the philosophy and because of that they feel the practices are very restrictive don't do this don't do this don't do this don't do this and because of that they feel very they feel bhakti is very restrictive Now, there was a i was at a interfaith conference in america and there is a universal problem they call it pk not the movie pk which is there in india pk means preachers kids so preachers kids practically never become never what is becoming preachers very rarely they even become they follow that religion so they did a survey of that of such kids and they found one thing that so one preachers kid was asked who is a priest and he gave a definition that the priest is someone who is constantly worried that someone somewhere is having some fun <laughs> that someone somewhere is having some fun so they start thinking that priest means you know all the activities that give us fun they tell them don't do it don't do it don't do it don't do it so what happens now children parents can children can feel this very prohibitive and children may feel no these activities are bad you shouldn't do them but if they tr if parents try to stop them forcibly then what will happen the children will go away 
and they will still go away eventually because how long can parents control the children but once they go away they will become very hostile if somebody tell them that you know if you know you're doing the parents tell the children no you're doing this and it's wrong and you are so foolish you are so arrogant that you're not understanding it one day you will come crawling back on your knees to me and will acknowledge that i am right now if this is how we try to force them to do the right thing that even if they eventually do the wrong thing and realize it is wrong they will not come back because it has become not a issue of right or wrong it has become issue of ego so sometimes when we want to control others it is not just because we want their good it is also because we want our image to be protected oh this person is trained by me this person is connected with me if this person does something wrong that will reflect badly on me and i want my reputation to be spotless so often our desire to control others is not just because we want their good but it's also because we want our own good image and especially if we try to control others because of our own insecurity then people sense that and then they feel you, know, you are more interested in your good image than what is what, what what i feel what my emotions are what my concerns are so in a sense we could say that for which god vishnu to not intervene over here it's a disaster happening why don't you intervene why don't you do something but here is also exhibited the opulence of renunciation one of the six opulences of the lord is renunciation renunciation means that even if that we are not attached to things going right we talk about renunciation at one level in terms of objects or oh, give up wealth uh, give up power that is renunciation but one aspect of renunciation is also that if things don't go according to our plan then we don't get extremely agitated about it okay we, we let go of it so people have free will and we can't control their free will always i was in i was in princeton and there there there's couple uh, uh, audience of hindu scholars was there or hindu students and hindu scholars so they have a lot of conceptions about the about the indian epics so one of the conceptions is that krishna is a war mongering god hmm? that krishna caused war and so one person asked this question that when when duryodhana fell in the maya sabha in the assembly at that time he slipped and he thought it was normal surface but the water he slipped and he fell so the queens laughed over there and yudhishthir tried to stop them for laughing but krishna did not stop them or krishna did not intervene so was it that krishna deliberately wanted duryodhan to be insulted so that the war would take place so i said that krishna actually instigated the war and now what happened so then i mean so they said that is krishna a war mongering god so i said krishna himself went as a shanti dut he went as a peace envoy and the most accommodating terms he sought peace so if krishna had wanted to instigate war then why would krishna have gone as a peace messenger so now apparently some devotee had gone there before me and he had spoken that the same krishna who spoke externally to duryodhan to proposing peace that same krishna from within duryodhan's heart told him don't accept the peace proposal now i don't know how they got contact with paramatma to come to know this <laughs> if you see there is no indication of anything like this in the mahabharat krishna is earnestly seeking peace in fact i have a whole class on this how krishna uses dharma sorry sam dam bhed and dand all the four methods to somehow try to avoid war so now this is krishna is super soul is there but krishna does not determine our decisions krishna gives us the necessary information the intelligence the recollection based on our desires so it is not that krishna uh stop duryodhan from accepting and duryodhan didn't want to accept and then as a super soul krishna might have given him rationalizations now in this particular case 
when Krishna did not stop uh, the queens from laughing. At one thing, at one point, it, see something is humorous and the humorous should not be seen to be malicious. There is a difference. Humor means so something just happens. Sometimes somebody makes a joke about somebody else and everybody laughs. Now, it might be just an innocent joke. But, say if A makes a joke about B and everybody laughs and now if B is already thinking that you know A is hostile to me, A is my enemy, then something which is an innocent humorous joke starts appearing to be malicious. You, know, you dare you laugh at me like this? No, actually that was not the intention at all. So it was just funny. Now when Krishna told the queen not to laugh, it was not that that triggered the war. It was not that that triggered Duryodhan's enemy. Duryodhan's enemy. Before that itself, Duryodhan had already tried two big things. He had already tried to assassinate Bhima by giving him poison. And he had tried to assassinate all the Pandavas along with their mother by having them burned in Varnavat. So, if at all anything, this incident was a trigger. And that it was a trigger. It was Krishna some, uh, didn't want to... Uh, didn't want to Antagonize Duryodhan. See, some, some people are just so puffed up that sometimes some puffed up people get deflated. Other people say, Now you are coming back to earth. So it's not that you get joy in insulting others, but just getting some, some people who are just high up. So Duryodhan was like that high up. So Krishna wanted to just ground him. So Krishna was always the well wisher of everyone. But still, the point I, I talk about this is that, that Krishna, uh, he tries at times to intervene in people's lives. But there are times when Krishna also is a hands-off approach. And you can't do anything. Some people are just the way they are. So by acknowledging that something is just not our responsibility. That if we think that we can control others and that we should be able to control others, then we will end up alienating them and agitating ourselves. So, the first point I said, in, uh, the point that we, sometimes we should not, part of being responsible, not taking responsibility, the first point was that we should know that everyone has free will and we, others can't control their free will, not even God can do that. Any comments or questions about this? Yes, please. Well, thank you very much for this very insightful thought. But uh, maybe on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, like what you say is hmm. very much applicable. But uh, what would you, how, what would you suggest for if you, if in a group you want to give some message? Uh, do we? What yeah. Okay. That's a good question. If in a group we have to give some message, then do we uh, do we also have to adjust or sensitize ourselves at that time? Yeah, we always need to be sensitive. But generally, in a group, it is a little more generic. It is not so much, so much specific. So, if we are giving a broad philosophical instruction, even if it is meant for a particular person, that's what we have in the mind. But if we don't make it obvious to everyone whom we are talking about, then it is as in say in the akalman ke liye ishara kafi hota hai so these kind of sayings you can't translate them into english you know a sign is enough for the intelligent well it doesn't that sweetness is not there in it mm -hmm. but anyway the point is that yes in a group if we look at prabhupada's example also actually prabhupada when he would give classes when he would uh, write his purports he was quite categorical in establishing siddhanta but especially with respect to lapses or wrongdoings among devotees, Prabhupada was not at all very, very heavy about it. Prabhupada was very understanding, very accommodating. And Prabhupada did not judge or condemn people for their wrongdoings. And Prabhupada naturally hurt if somebody did wrong. But Prabhupada maintained the relationship with that person. He never cast, you know, there's practically no incidents that I know that very castigated a person so much that that person went away. Prabhupada generally would, <coughs> on an individual level, he would always be gentle. 
so the whole point is that that there is a time uh, to instruct and correct and there is a time to just let go people let go and experience and then they will correct themselves so the understanding when it will be depends on how receptive or how hostile somebody is to our inputs so if our giving some like updesho hi murkhana prakopaya na shantaye that giving instructions to those who are foolish it only agitates them more so instead of that uh, it is better that let them learn their lesson but in general if we are talking with a broad community of people then without making it obvious whom we are targeting if we give a broad instruction then that person will probably get the message okay thank you so i'll move on to the next point the second point i was going to make is that <clears throat> we all are finite beings and we have finite capacities so because of this we all need to choose our battles choose our battles means a standard strategy in war is that <clears throat> if an advancing army if a big formidable army is attacking another kingdom another say attacking a fort so what happens is that they send a a small contingent to attack from one direction and the defending army presumes oh this big army has come we need all our resources to defend and they go in that direction to defend and then the major part of the army attacks from the other direction and then by that way this army is caught unprepared in fact when duryodhan suspected that the pandavas are in are in matsya in matsya uh, in the matsya kingdom at that time because bhima we had killed kichaka and kichaka was so powerful that very few people could kill him so at that time he decided to attack and he used the strategy you know he had uh, the trigarta king susharma attack the matsya kingdom from one side and because he was also a powerful king and he was atta- he was attacking so the whole army went to defend over there and then the entire kuru army came from the other side and attacked and there was no one to defend and that's why bhumijay the son of virat along with brihanalla who was actually arjuna they were the only people left to go and defend from that side so what applies in war also applies in real life at sometimes we want to control one thing we want to fight one battle but in trying to fight that battle we get so obsessed with it and that's not that important a battle that we get so consumed by it we get so agitated by it that some bigger battle that is to be fought we we have no energy we have no attention we have no intelligence we have no emotional stability left for that so we need to uh, choose our battles sometimes some people are doing something wrong and we may get very agitated by that why is this person doing like this but then we may have some very important meeting some very important service some very important class and if we let ourselves get too worked up by what that person is doing then this important service may be lost may, we may, may not be able to perform properly in it so uh, so choosing our battles means okay i want to i want to do this well but if this person is not cooperating let go let go so tolerance is a strength over here and tolerance means at one sense learning which battles not to fight learning tolerance means learning to accept defeat in some battles so that we can win in some battles or at least to accept a reversal accept a setback in some battles so sometimes if we want to one of the biggest problems for people who want to be successful in life especially people who are talented uh, there's a survey done that ha- talented people how many talented people really become successful there some there are there are childhood prodigies some people just phenomenally good in childhood Uh, if you see on youtube there are movies there are there are videos of babies in diapers they are playing violin 
and they are playing it accompanying with the orchestra everybody else is playing now, how do they learn it uh, from a reductionistic scientific perspective there is no way they could know it it's clear that they have learned something from their previous lives uh, but the point is that these are phenomenally talented prodigies how many prodigies actually become successes in their later life so often the, the childhood talent doesn't translate into success because people are what is called perfectionists they want everything to be perfect no everything can't be perfect no sometimes some things we just have to accept this is the way it is but let me focus on this so if we don't learn to choose our battles properly then we obsess over a small battle and we end up losing a big battle mm. so it's like uh, you know if we could say life is like a cricket match now in a cricket match sometimes when the bowler bowls a bouncer and the pitch is very unpredictable and the batsman says i am going to hit a six on the bouncer and the bouncer is such a bad ball that the the, the, the batsman gets injured trying to hit when the hand gets injured the head gets injured and then what happens is the batsman has to just hobble back or the batsman can't perform properly and then the batsman gets out but if there's a bouncer just stuck under it and then then there's over pitch delivery you can hit it for a big boundary or whatever so like that sometimes some problems are like bouncers for us and you know actually even in batting the batsman requires certain amount of humility to bend down <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't bend down then the bouncer will hit so like that life sends bouncers our way sometimes but at least with respect to cricket you can easily make out this is a bouncer but with respect to sometimes what happens in a pitch there is uneven bounce so you see they think the ball is normal and then suddenly it bounces so like that sometimes we think this is a small problem and suddenly it grows out of proportion but we have to deal with the problem as it actually is not as we think it is meant to be now, this person is meant to obey me why is this person not obeying me but if that person is not obeying that person is rebelling we have to let go at that time so i thought this is normal ball it's bouncing well then duck at that time so like that we have finite capacities and recognizing the limitation of our capacities is vital for us to use those capacities properly so <clears throat> sometimes we are put in situations where we just can't do anything about anything or anything about a particular thing so at that time we just need to we need to just recognize just stay silent i was talking with one senior devotee who was a was a gbc member a guru and a sanyasi in our movement and now he has retired so i asked him that it was a nice talk we had so i asked him about you know how how when he was a gbc member he was like in the center and now he's like a little in the sidelines so how does he feel about it so he told me now i feel liberated from the need to have an opinion about everything that is happening in iskon <laughs> i feel liberated from the need to have an opinion about everything that is happening in iskon because sometimes what happens different devotees do different things oh this person spoke like that this person did like that this person did like that what do you think about this what do you think about this what do you think about this and some people are what is called motor mouth you know they are loose cannon loose loose cannon is like if there is a cannon and a cannon is meant to shoot the enemy but if the cannon is loose normally a cannon you have to press it forcefully then it shoots out but loose cannon means you touch it and the cannon goes out and then instead of injuring the opposite person it may injure some of your own members only so some people their mouth is like a loose cannon so little trigger and they speak and when they start speaking they they hurt others and they hurt themselves also so so, uh, so such people so actually when we have to give if we have to give our opinion something we have to think carefully a very important aspect of learning to speak effectively is to learn when not to speak <laughs> most of us when we talk about speaking about okay how can i speak more articulately how can i speak more eloquently or attractively yes all that is good but especially if you are in leadership position when not to speak that is extremely important many times i have seen that uh, when i ask his own sadhat maharaj of any controversial issues 
in our movement. I am a part of Shastri Advisory Council, so we have to deal with many of these issues. So when I asked Maharaj about this, Maharaj says that in one particular volatile issue, Maharaj said that you know, I have heard good arguments in support for it and I have heard bad arguments in support for it. And I have had heard good arguments against it and I have heard bad arguments against it. I have not yet heard any clinching argument on this side. So I am not, I have not decided anything about it. So, <laughs> so it was a very balanced opinion in the sense that not that he is non-committal, he is not saying that uh, I don't care about it. He says if somebody presents a clinching argument, I am open to hear about it. But because I have not got a heard a clinching argument, I have heard good arguments and bad arguments. So what happens by this statement, sometimes some people may really make bad arguments. But if we just hold them for their bad arguments and say this is just your, your case is so poor, but they may have good arguments also. So basically, there are times when if we want to focus on a particular service, then just speaking about this and speaking about that and speaking about that, we may unnecessarily end up creating enemies. So if we recognize our capacities are finite, then use those capa finite capacities in a focused way for doing what is our priority, what is our purpose. And that way we can be constructive, we can be productive. So this is the second point. Uh, we have because our capacity is finite we need to know which battles to we need to choose which battles we fight any questions or comments about this okay so the last point i will conclude with that so then i said that third point is that now we may say i want to make the other person use their free will properly but we need to use our free will properly and to use our free will properly, we need to do what it takes to nourish ourselves. So sometimes we may want this person, I want this person to do the right thing. But if you get too emotionally involved in some person, then we may become so agitated that we may end up using our free will wrongly. We may become impulsive, we may speak rashly. Going back to the earlier example, if somebody is about to go off a cliff or a high building they are about to walk off and we tell them don't walk and we run towards them and we try to catch them and now they are so determined to walk off there and if we try to if we catch and we hold on to them instead of we saving them they will drag us down and not only will they fall down and injure themselves we will also fall down and injure ourselves so if we get too emotionally entangled with someone and that person is going on the wrong track and if we go along with them then we will also fall down. So sometimes getting too emotionally involved in anything can, can weaken our capacity to use our free will properly. So I was talking with one of our leaders he said that it is only the detached people who are the most loving who can be the most loving. So I was thinking about this, I wrote a Gita Daily article about this, that detachment is not absence of emotion, it is absence of emotional dependence. See, if we are detached, that doesn't mean we have no emotion, we don't care for anyone. But there is a difference between emotion and emotional dependence. So when we are emotionally dependent on someone, then that person's pleasure or displeasure with us becomes the basis of our actions. This is so Dhritarashtra was attached to Duryodhan. And what does attached mean? Means he was emotionally dependent on Duryodhan. And if Duryodhan became very demanding about something, if Duryodhan was upset about something, then Dhritarashtra just couldn't say no about it. And what he would say is if Vidura told him, just don't do this. He said, but he's my son. He's my son. Yes, he's your son and you're meant to care for him. So, no renunciation or detachment doesn't mean absence of emotion. But it means absence of emotional dependence. So, absence of emotional dependence means that one doesn't become so emotionally entangled with the other person that one can't act properly. Now, this emotional dependence can be in both ways. That both ways means that if the person, I force the person to listen to me and still I am kept, I am caught. Is this person doing what I am telling or not? Is this person doing what I am telling or not? 
and we are trying to micro control the other person and emotional dependence can also be that if this person doesn't do what i am telling how dare this person not do what is what is going to happen to them what is going to happen to them what is going to happen to them so so if we tell them to do something and then we worry if, if we are in the position of authority and we tell them to do something because it's our project or whatever and if we are constantly worried is this person upset with me is this person upset with me no we have to get the thing done we can't be emotionally caught in that so an example for this would be surgery no if a surgeon has to operate someone now operation means there will be pain and the patient will oppose now, the patient usually has to give consent if the patient is minor then the adult who is guardian of the patient has to give consent now if the patient is a minor and the patient is cr uh, crying and um, uh, screaming and protesting i don't want to do this then the doctor cannot be so emotionally dependent on the patient that the doctor doesn't give the injection or doesn't do the surgery the child says no this causes so much pain i don't want the injection and the doctor says i won't give the injection if the doctor has to give the injection then lack of emotional dependence means you do what you are told to do but suppose that patient is adult and the patient says i, I don't want to take this injection i don't want to do the surgery and the patient just walks away and now the doctor is meant to treat the next patient but the doctor is still worried you know oh why did this patient not listen to me you know doesn't he have faith in me i am such a good doctor i have cured so many patients and how dare this patient not obey me and there might be also be concern what will happen to this patient the patient may die but we, the doctor may be insecure how can he not listen to me and if that makes the patient doctor inattentive and doctor can't then treat the next patients then again it will be a problem so we need to do what it takes to nourish ourselves by which we can use our free will properly and that's why when i talk about choosing our battles one part of choosing our battles is if something we don't have control on we let go and we focus on what we have control on but even to do what we have control on we need to have some calmness we need to have some clarity and sometimes we need to just, just take a step back take a step back and nourish ourselves whatever now we have to see what nourishes ourselves it may be hearing scriptures it may be chanting it may be associating with some devotees it may be it may be just uh, contemplating on uh, meditate on some verses whatever nourishes us we have to find that and we have to do that and then doing that also involves letting go letting go and when we do that we let go at that time we let go of things so that we can catch hold of our thoughts otherwise we hold on to things and our thoughts go wild and then we become dysfunctional but we let go of things so that we can catch hold of our thoughts we can calm our thoughts and then we can concentrate our thoughts on that which is productive on that which on that in which we can be effective and that is the way we can function properly prabhupada was like that when prabhupada found that in india people were not receptive people were receptive but not serious people were receptive yes, you come and do some katha the prabhupad was in mumbai and sumti moraji he asked her for she was the owner of the sindhya shipping company he asked for a passage to america and she said swami ji if you want to speak bhagavatam you just come to my house i'll hear every day the prabhupad didn't want to speak bhagavatam like that as a pious ritual prabhupad wanted to speak bhagavatam as a means of transforming people so then Uh, prabhupad he saw that india indians are not yet ready he is enamored by the west so he was trying trying so he had, he had spent 40 years in india just prabhupad let go of india and he chose this is a battle i can't fight right now and he went to america so when we when we let go of the battles which we can't fight then we can focus on the battles which we can fight and Prabhupad was miraculously successful in America by Krishna's mercy, and then when he came back to India, at that time he not only fought that battle but he won that battle. Of course, not many people became devotees per se, but many people became very appreciative. Many people became life members, and the foundation of the movement was set in India. And in the next generation, the seeds that were sown were uh, reaped widely. Where India, India is known as now become the powerhouse of of the movement entirely. Have, there are more devotees more temples more books distributed it's big so prabhupad chose his battles and we too can learn from him follow his example and choose our battles wisely so i'll summarize i spoke on the theme of being responsible taking responsibility 
means knowing when not to take responsibility and within that I, I so the theme was that here Brahm, Brahma and Vishnu did not intervene when this chaos happened in the assembly of Daksha. So I talked about three points first is that everyone has free will and others can't sometimes control their free will not even God can control. <coughs> when we are in authority position and somebody is subordinate we see them doing something wrong and we try to stop them now that may be because we want their good or that may be because we also want to have good image that our subordinates are very good and if we try to control them too much they may end up becoming offensive and sin is bad if they if they don't listen to us they will do sin but sin will bring humility and they may come back to the right track again offense will disconnect them from krishna so sometimes we help people learn by their intelligence and sometimes we let people go so that they learn by their experience and <clears throat> when to do this it requires under uh, reading people properly understanding how receptive or how hostile they are to our intervention and second point i talked is that because our capacities are finite we need to choose our battles wisely so a, if a defending army just sends its full force to attack a small contingent of the advancing army and the uh, remaining advancing army uh, attacks on the other side the defending fort will be overpowered so like that sometimes a small problem we put all our emotional attention in that small problem and something a bigger responsibility we are unable to do that so <clears throat> uh, we have to see which what is more important for us and let go of small things so tolerance means uh, learning to accept defeat in small battles so that we can fight and win the bigger battles. Uh, tolerance means that when life throws a bouncer at us, we learn to duck under it, not try to uh, deal with every problem the same way. By using our energies, our finite capacities, where we can be most productive, we can <coughs> actually make a difference instead of simply reducing ourselves to importance by uh, fighting to do fighting to win battles that we can't win and the last part was in order to fight the battles that we can fight we still need to nourish ourselves so that we can use our free will properly if somebody is <coughs> is walking off a high building we may actually want to save them but if they are not understanding how it's so dangerous and they are bent on the going that way down if we hold on to them they may they may cause us to fall down also so getting too emotionally entangled in anything or anyone can can weaken our capacity to act properly so detachment is not lack of not absence of emotion but absence of emotional dependence the emotional dependence can come in two ways we get the person to do the right thing but we are constantly worried is that person liking me or not hmm? like a patient like a doctor who gives an injection to a child but is worried is the child, child liking me or not or it can come also if somebody goes away from us and we are still obsessed with why did that person not listen to me and we don't do our duty like a patient a doctor who's who's agitated the patient didn't take their advice and can't give proper treatment to other patients so just as Krishna has the opulence of renunciation where, where he can let go of things that when somebody is not ready to listen Krishna was not a war mongering God Krishna sought peace with Duryodhan but when Duryodhan did not listen Krishna accepted that Krishna accepted failure in his mission as a peace messenger and therein he accepted his opulence of renunciation so similarly as devotees of Krishna we also need to exhibit renunciation not just of things but also of controllership so sometimes in, uh, we need to take a step back nourish ourselves and then fight the battles which we can fight Prabhupada was pragmatic in this when he found that the battle in India could not be won he cho opened a new front in America and gained dramatic victory over there and eventually gained dramatic victory in India also by following in his footsteps and choosing our where to take responsibility wisely we can tap opportunities and make constructive contributions. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? 
Yes, you can go. You are telling about uh, emotional dependence and uh, micromanagement. So it's like some of our subordinates, they feel that we should do micromanagement in their life and they feel inspired that we get uh, involved in their lives more. And they also feel inspired by that. So our doing that is that, okay, we should be detached. Okay. So if somebody feels, somebody wants us to micro control, their lives, they want us to be involved in their lives, then should we do that or should we avoid micro controlling? See now what is micro control? It's an assessment. So it will vary from person to person. Different people have different psychologies and understanding people is important for dealing with them properly. So when somebody is doing a service and we ask them, how is the service going? Now they feel valued, they feel cared for, they feel concerned about me and you want to, uh, you want to help me. Some other people, you give them a service and tell them, how is it going? Don't you trust me? I'll get it done. So why do you have to intervene again and again? So people are not like machines that you can, we can use one program for all people. So that's why we have to see uh, how different people respond to different ways. So, sometimes when we appreciate someone and the person feels, thank you very much. Some people, when we appreciate them, they just think, you know, we are flattering them so that we can get them to do more things. So, we have to see, you know, sometimes when we speak with people, we also have to hear how people respond to what we speak. And you can learn a lot of, lot about people by how they respond. So, what, what they, what their need is, what their concern is, what their sore spot is, all that we learn by, by hearing people, by watching their actions. So basically, it will vary from person to person. We, in principle, we shouldn't want to micro-control anyone, but if people want more, some people like more guidance, some people like less guidance. And we have to, we have to modulate the relationship accordingly. Of course, over a period of time, it's good to to set people free and to train people to think for themselves because we don't want them to we may not be always be available for them but how fast we set home free that will vary from person to person so it's like say a mother has a baby and now ev every mother wants the baby to learn to walk on on by themselves but some babies may start walking at the at six months not six months maybe that's too early maybe at one year or something like that. Some babies may start walking freely only after maybe 15 months, 17 months. So now, after the baby starts walking freely, the mother should not keep holding the hand afterwards. But the mother should not let go of the hand when the baby is not yet ready to walk. So we will have to oh, moderate according to each person's level. But the mother cannot be always holding the hand. So we cannot always be guiding people on every decision. But instead of just saying that you take this decision, uh, and they may feel that we are washing hands of them. They may feel abandoned by that. Then we can be a little more uh, diplom, little more sensitive. We can say that, what do you think you should do? He says, no, no, no. I'll do whatever you tell me. No, I want to know what do you think you should do. Uh, you know, I think if I do this, this will happen. If I do this, this will happen. Therefore, I want to do this. Then we can also understand how how maturely they are thinking, and yeah, it makes sense. You can go ahead. Yeah, did you think about instead of saying no, this is wrong? You say, did you think about this? Oh, you know, I didn't think about this possibility. So we basically uh, get them thinking, and if their thinking is deficient in some way, we point it out. So if Krishna had wanted to give Arjuna a decision, fight the war, you know, Krishna could have spoken that in just Yuddhas, one word. He didn't have to speak seven hundred verses. The seven hundred verses were spoken so that Krishna could explain to Arjuna the, the rationale for the decision and not just the rationale for the decision, the, not, the reasoning, re, not just the reasoning for the decision but also uh, the world view underlining the reasoning so that Arjuna could take decisions on his own in future. So sim, the similar should be our broad attitude in dealing with others. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Prabhu.
so if it's like a disastrous thing that somebody is doing then then that is something which has to be considered so when that that had better be avoided but it's it depends on the <coughs> it also largely depends on the strength of the conditioning from the past also we all come with certain samskaras from the past and certain things we just can't do without at a particular phase in our life so even by intelligence i understand this is insubstantial but no it doesn't seem insubstantial at that time it doesn't seem just temporary or flickering it just seems irresistible at that time so then if a desire is troubling us too much then uh, then we may have to do the needful to go through that experience the important thing is not to shift our purpose it's like if i am going in this direction i may go by this path i may go with this path so oh. sometimes we may fail in we, sometimes we may set certain standards and we may not be able to stick to those standards so <coughs> i gave a whole class in uh, new york on central new jersey on this topic of that even if we fail we can fail in krishna consciousness not fail out of krishna consciousness what does that mean fail out of krishna consciousness means say somebody wants to fast and they feel very hungry i, I want to eat i want to eat i want to eat i want to eat now because of that they just give in and they eat now you could say from the standard of fasting they have failed but somebody can fail and they think oh this fasting doesn't work for me this krishna consciousness i was told if krishna, if i become krishna conscious i will transcend all bodily needs and i couldn't transcend hunger therefore krishna consciousness doesn't work and you not only give up fasting but you also give up lose faith in krishna consciousness also then that means we are failing out of krishna consciousness but okay no krishna consciousness is ultimate if i understand krishna consciousness is ultimately the connection of the soul with the with krishna and that soul's connection will be naturally channeled through the body and different bodies have different in circumstantial needs so my body can't tolerate hunger so ayurveda says that if somebody has a very high vat prakriti vah pitt prakriti then you can't tolerate hunger much so whatever certain bodies can't tolerate hunger so accept that and okay it's not that krishna consciousness is not working krishna consciousness in this pattern may not work for me then i am feeling but i am feeling in krishna consciousness that okay instead of thinking of krishna consciousness as see this is a success this is failure and we think this is krishna consciousness but krishna consciousness is so big that fa- so this is success and this is failure we think success is krishna consciousness but krishna consciousness is so big that krishna consciousness includes success and failure sometimes i may eat food and then i may sit down a chant i will sit down and hear and i am able to be more krishna conscious by that so uh, it may well be that somebody who is fasting they may apparently be here 
and they are successful in Krishna consciousness. But if that person is looking down at others, you know, this person eating so much food. Somebody fasts and then goes to the kitchen and sees who is eating what. This person is so attached. This person is such a sense gratifier. Then their body is fasting, but their ego is feasting. And they are not going to be Krishna conscious. So we shouldn't reduce Krishna consciousness to one standard and success in one standard. So even if we can't be here, we can be here. And this is not failure. Failure is Krishna conscious so big that it accommodates failure also. That is the mood of Apichet Sudurachar. Bajite Mamananyavak Sadhureva Samantavya Samyag Vivasitohisa. And even if somebody commits the most reprehensible of activities, but still if they remain determined to serve me, then they are to be considered well situated. They are to be considered the word sa sadhu can mean good, sadhu, sadhu, very good. Or it can mean sadhu can mean saintly also. So some acharyas say that this means saintly, that they be considered saintly. Some others say that means some others say that it's good. They're still they're still good. Because then they are moving towards the good purpose. So uh, we have to just see how much inner resistance we face when we are doing a particular activity. So if we can't, if we and we and process with our intelligence, but still there is a lot of resistance from inside. Then we may have to, you know, we can't be here. We'll have to be here. We have to learn through experience. So we shouldn't consider learning through experience as a failure. Because we are learning, if we just go through the experience and don't learn, then we keep repeating the experience again and again and again and again and again, and then that is falling out, that is failing out of Krishna consciousness. So we don't have to. Whatever happens, if we decide, I am never going to stop trying to be Krishna conscious, then. We want. Uh, we will find that Krishna consciousness is very accommodating. It is. It is very broad in its scope, and we can find our way to be Krishna conscious. What happens is that uh, Krishna consciousness is not so difficult, but we are attached to a particular way of being Krishna conscious. Either we ourselves are attached to being Krishna conscious in that way, or others are attached to that we should be Krishna conscious in that way. Then that is what the uh, problem comes up. But if we recognize that I have my body, I have my mind, and it is with my body and my mind that I have to practice bhakti. So how can I do that best? So I can take guidance from others, but I have to learn it myself. We don't work for our body and mind. That is like simply pandering to the body and mind. That will take us make us fall out of Krishna consciousness. But we can't work against our body and mind also. Because that there are resources, so we have to work with our body and mind. So that means that there will sometimes be conflict, with but we can't have in a, a state of constant inner conflict. Mm. And there is a constant inner torment going on. Then we have to we have to uh, make sure that we are fighting that battle at a level which we can win, not at a level that we are constantly being wounded and crushed. Okay. So, thank you very much. Krantra Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki, Itai Gaur Premanande.